It's time for Wise Money with Corhorn Financial Group with certified financial planners Kevin Corhorn, Mike Bernard, and Josh Gregory. Welcome to another episode of the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group, where every week we're helping you take your next wise step in your financial life. Thanks for being here, friends. My name is Mike Bernard. I'm your host. I'm also one of the CFPs. No Kevin Corhorn today once again, but with me next to me in the KFG studio is my business partner and fellow CFP, Josh Gregory. We love the health savings account, don't we? Yeah. And uh, for those who are eligible to use it, they need to make the most of this amazing tax shelter. So today we're going to share three unique ways to optimize how you contribute to your HSA. That and more coming up on the Wise Money Show. So the HSA is a very complicated animal, but it's a Im- very important part. If you're eligible of your overall financial life, you've got to make some great decisions. We're going to help you with it right now. If, uh, if you have questions for the program, we'd love to hear from you. If you have needs as well, we're here for you also. You can call or text us 574-222-2000. That's 574-222-2000 online. Wisemoneyshow.com is where you can find us. And then all over social media, search the Wise Money Show. You'll find us there as well. So like Josh said, we do love the HSA. If you have, if you qualify for one, there are several ways that you can use it, making it an extremely versatile tool in your overall financial life, not just to help with today's or tomorrow's medical expenses. It can mean way much more in your financial life. Specifically, we're going to talk about what are some unique ways you can get money into the HSA. Should be simple, right? Put money in, helps you on taxes, pull it out for medical expenses. Done. Now, there's some unique, some creative ways to get money in. We're going to hit those right now. Before we do, level the playing field, Josh. So so who's eligible for an HSA? How's it work? Yeah, unfortunately, it's not everybody, right? You have to be a participant in a high deductible health insurance plan. doesn't have to be through work. It could be through the marketplace or the Affordable Care Act, um, it, you know, a plan that you put in place yourself, but it has to be an HSA eligible high deductible plan. If you are eligible, the HSA portion of this is essentially a specialized savings account. It's a place for you to set aside money that you plan to use for for medical expenses. And it's in, in that way, kind of a reimbursement type of an account. Typically, uh, some HSAs give you a debit card or even checks that you can write to pull money back out when it's time to pay a doctor's bill or buy some prescription medicine or, or something like that, pay for a procedure. Well, the, the benefit ultimately is the tax savings that comes from these accounts. It's not just a, a savings bucket that you can pour money into and have it for that, uh, that health-related rainy day. No, the, the purpose is to get a tax deduction when you make your contribution, it sits in the account and is not taxed as it earns money. And then when you pull the money out ultimately to pay that medical bill or whatever, uh, you get it out tax-free as well. Most, um, I I guess you could probably say every other tax shelter out there, you're going to pay tax either on the front end or the back end. Right. And maybe you get some tax sheltering in between, but you don't get the benefits all throughout the life of those dollars. Yeah, that's that's right. And so extremely unique. And then you might have heard Josh say, well, while it's in the account, the earnings aren't taxed as well. Well, what earnings? Bah. <laughs> well, there's a strategy here. We've talked about it before. We're not going to hit it in depth right now, but you could choose, hey, I'm going to treat my HSA like it's long-term money. I'm not going to touch it. When a medical expense comes up, I'm going to pay for it out of cash flow or out of other resources. I'm going to let my HSA grow. I'm going to invest that thing for the long term. Okay. And and that allows you to gain more interest tax deferred that you can then pull out tax-free. Anyway. Yeah. The the principle here is that uh, you have to use the money for medical expenses, but it doesn't have to be medical expenses you incurred this year. You could reimburse yourself years down the road, and in the meantime, just let the money sit and let it grow if you're investing it you know, in, in a more growth-oriented investment. So lots of ways to use the HSA. Very important that you're doing comprehensive financial planning. This alone might be the reason you get a conversation started with a CFP so that they can help you with some creativity on how to use it towards achieving whatever your financial goals are. Now, the sh- purpose of this show is what are some unique ways to get money into an HSA? All right, you might 
you might know one or two of these. Might be a review if you're if you're really experienced with an HSA. But but the, we've got three ideas, unique ways to get money into that HSA. The first one is contributing out of your paycheck as opposed to out of your pocket. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is really our favorite. It's yeah. it's good to start with the best. Um, you know, if if you're one of the millions of Americans that have changed jobs and you suddenly find yourself working for an employer that offers an HSA eligible plan, this is something you need to educate yourself on and you need to figure it out here early on in the year because as soon as you're eligible to be on that health insurance plan and you could open an HSA, we want you to think very you know, seriously about contributing out of your paycheck every single pay period, just like you contribute to your retirement plan, trickle some money into that HSA. And it's it's because it not only saves you money on your federal and state income taxes, it will also, this is a unique feature on the HSA, it will also save you money on FICA taxes. And FICA taxes, if you're not familiar with that, that is how Every employee is paying into the Social Security and Medicare system. You pay your half, your employer pays their half. Well, your contributions can go in before those taxes are incurred on your on your new deposits into the HSA. And again, if you're not a geek like us, you might think, well, yeah, it's pre-tax, right? That's how my 401k works, 403b, that's how that stuff works. Nope, no, it doesn't. Nope, nope. So your 401k contribution, if you're contributing pre-tax, saves you federal and state taxes. You're still paying FICA on that money. OK, the HSA, if you are if you if you start that new job, like Josh said, or or whatever, and, and you choose to, well, I'll put money in my HSA if I feel like it or if I've got an extra thousand dollars laying around, I'll just write a check and deposit into my HSA. Good. That becomes a deduction on the front page of your tax return. It will it will reduce your federal taxes and your state taxes if you live in a state that has them. So in that way, a contribution out of your pocket to an HSA saves you federal and state taxes. But if you have it come right out of your paycheck, if you're able to do that, if if your HSA plan, a high deductible health plan is a group plan and they allow you to contribute directly to an HSA, it's going to save you federal taxes. It's going to save you state taxes. But like Josh said, it's also going to save you FICA taxes. That's Be right. aware, by it saving you FICA taxes, that means your wages that are reported for calculating your Social Security uh, income, it's going to be slightly lower. Right. The money that you defer out of your paycheck going into the HSA, you're going to avoid the Social Security tax, the FICA tax, but you're not going to have that that portion of your income show up in the Social Security calculation for 99.999% of people doesn't really matter. Right. It's like a rounding error, okay? Social Security is based on 35 years of work history. It Cutting a couple thousand dollars off of the top of your income that so it's not reported and, and counted in your Social Security calculation is not going to make much of a difference at all. Yeah, But you got to be aware of that, yeah. especially those of you that are really detail-oriented and looking over those Social Security statements saying, all right, did they report the right level of earnings? note that money that you contribute to your HSA out of your paycheck, it's going to save you that FICA tax, but that that money that you contribute isn't going to show up as income for Social Security. Yeah. And even if it did have a tiny little um, impact on your Social Security benefits years down the road, you're still money ahead by having this money in your own pocket where you can do something productive with it and let it grow. Yeah. So the big point is with this first unique way to get money into an HSA is you've got a choice. You can contribute out of pocket. You can contribute out of your paycheck if your employer allows you. You could do both, right? As long as you don't exceed that overall contribution limit, which we'll hit coming up. Um, but there is a tax difference. There's a tax benefit. There's an extra benefit to contributing out of your paycheck. Now, there's a couple... Uh, People that can't do that, we'll explain that coming up, will also hit the contribution limits and then two additional unique ways to contribute to your HSA. So that and more coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Hello, YouTube. Thanks for being here. This is the Wise Money Show. You're at the Wise Money Show channel. What you're watching right now is our weekly one-hour talk show that airs right here on this channel, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, every Saturday morning, also on podcast, by the way, but also also on a couple radio stations locally in Northern Indiana. That's why we have the commercial breaks. That's why we've got a specific time uh, commitment here. So uh, so yeah, so um, make sure you check it out. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. 
turn on notifications so you're made aware every time a new you know a new episode comes out. If you're wanting something that's more directed, maybe something shorter, we've got next Y step videos that air on this channel as well all throughout the work week. If there's a financial concept you've thought of, odds are we've talked about it and created some content on it. So make sure you hit that subscribe button, turn on notifications so you're made aware every time we drop new content. If you have a question for the show uh, or a question or have some needs, leave a comment below. We'll get we'll hit listener questions later on in the program. So good. All right. So we got to hit over 2% owner in an HSA or in a, <laughs> in a business S corp mm -hmm. and contribution limits. Mm -hmm. So, all right. And then we'll get into and the other we'll two. The okay. <clears throat> Given the option contributing to your HSA directly out of your paycheck is beneficial. It's better. It saves you more taxes. There are some limitations you've got to be aware of. We're hitting that more right now. This is the wise money show. With Corhorn Financial Group, thanks for being here. My name is Mike Bernard. With me in the KFG studios, Joshua Gregory. Uh, every episode of The Wise Money Show is on podcast. Wherever you listen, go check it out. So just search The Wise Money Show. Subscribe or follow us there. Rate the program as well. We appreciate it. Okay, so we're talking about the three unique ways to get money into an HSA, not just the plain vanilla write a check, okay? There's three unique ways that you can get money into an HSA if you're eligible. One, the first one, is directly out of your paycheck, contributing out of your paycheck, has that income avoid FICA taxes? If you are a 2% or greater owner in an S Corp, not allowed to do it. That's right. Uh, you're allowed to contribute to an HSA. It just can't come out of your paycheck. Yeah. You don't get to save money on your FICA tax, as we were explaining in the last uh, segment there. Um, the, the other thing to keep in mind is you are limited in how much you're allowed to contribute to an HSA. And every year they ratchet up the contribution maximum by a little bit. This year's 2022, uh, the contribution limit is $7,300 for a family. And it's half that amount, $3,600, $3,650, I guess, yeah. um, for individuals. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's not nearly as large of a bucket for you to be able to contribute as a 401k or a 403b, some of these large retirement accounts. But it is an effective tool. It could be a great supplement for you. And again, that added benefit of contributing straight out of your paycheck saves you more taxes than those other, other tools. Now, t both of those tie them together. The reason why if you're a 2% or greater uh, shareholder in an S-Corp, the reason why they don't allow you to pay to contribute to the HSA right out of your paycheck is because employers are allowed to contribute directly to your HSA as well. Yeah. Just like for your 401k, the difference is the employer contribution counts towards those contribution limits. Yep. Okay. So there's some, there's some, um, there's some requirements that the IRS has put in place here to ensure that employer contributions or, or contributions out of a business they're not excessive. They don't exceed certain levels, and that's why there's that limitation for uh, for S corps. Josh, how many times in your career have you seen greater than two percent owners in S corps contributing to their HSA right out of the paycheck? Yeah, it. Well, I haven't really. Really, I've seen it all the time. And then you bring this up, and you're like, "You're not allowed to do it." And they're like, "Prove it." And it's like, "Okay, here you go. Here's the proof." And it's like. Well, I've been doing it. I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> so, right. So it's a it's a wow. it's a strange it's a strange rule, and there's it's hard. Like I don't think the IRS is sending out notices for this just yet. Well, yeah, a lot of a lot of business owners are always bummed to to learn that, and it sounds like some are defiant when yeah. they they learn it. But you know, it's it's open to their employees. It's not open to them. It's okay. You still will save money by contributing to the HSA. You're still going to want to take advantage of it because of those federal, state, and local tax savings. Yeah. All right. So the second unique way that you can get money into the health savings account is to optimize the use of catch-up contributions. And now we've talked about this recently. We did a we did an episode of the Wise Money Show where we talked about the really important ages that you that the inflection points in your life that change rules or open up new rules for in your finances. We went from, you know, zero to a hundred. So make sure you check out that episode. And we hit this one here, but for catch up contributions for all other tax shelters, Josh, what age do you need to turn in order to contribute extra, let's say to your 401k? 
Yeah, once you reach age 50, uh, you're allowed to start contributing more to an IRA or a Roth IRA or a 401k at work, but it's different for an HSA. And don't even ask me, why Why can't the government, why can't Congress get their ages right? Yeah. You know, like, why, why can't it be the same for an HSA? It's actually age 55 instead of age 50. So you got to wait a little longer to be able to start opening up a bigger contribution limit for yourself. Um, but if you do reach age 55, you're allowed to contribute an extra $1,000 to your HSA above and beyond whatever limit applied to you. If you're an individual, we said it was $3,650 this year. If you're a family contribution, you and your spouse, uh, it's $7,300 plus this now $1,000 catch-up contribution. And um, that really is per spouse as yeah. well. So here's the really unique part. You might you might say, well, I, I was aware of the catch up of a thousand bucks, and I was aware it's at age fifty five instead of age fifty. Yeah, I get that. Well, what you might not be aware of is, are you on a family plan? Are you married? And is your high deductible health plan a family plan? If so, in one spouse, the primary owner holder of the health insurance and the primary holder of the your current HSA. In the year that spouse turns 55, you can contribute the extra thousand to that to 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 the primary HSA to their HSA uh, bank account. If then the other spouse, if the if the non-primary spouse then turns 55, you can contribute an extra thousand to them as well. You might have even talked to your CPA about this, and your CPA said, "No, you can't. Nope, because I'm looking at the software right here. You can't do it." like we've had discussions here over the past decade or so. No, you are actually allowed to. You're, that other spouse would just need to open up their own health savings account to contribute that $1,000 to. Not get a separate uh, high deductible health plan, but a separate HSA, separate health savings bank account. You know, in some of the early years of these HSAs becoming eligible, I would you know, encourage clients to max out their HSA. We'd send them to their local credit union, maybe where they had their HSA held, and tell them, hey, uh, I'll use this year's numbers. You're allowed to contribute 7,300 as a married couple. And each of you is allowed to contribute another $1,000 as a catch-up because you're over age 55. And they would go to the credit union and they'd say, no, you're wrong, Josh. Uh, right. you, you can only contribute 8,300 in this case. Yeah. Um, and it turns out, you know, technically, I guess you could say they're right because we were operating with just one HSA account open for that primary carrier of, of the insurance. And now we've kind of, uh, had to do enough investigating on this and figure out, well, the code says each spouse is allowed to contribute. Why in the practical world is this not working yeah, out? Why are these banks and credit unions saying you can't do this? Right. And it's because we needed to go open a separate HSA bucket for that other spouse to, they can really only contribute a thousand dollars, just that extra catch up contribution in this case. Yeah. When you're going to open that HSA account, you're going to need nowadays, you're going to need to show proof that you have a high, de high deductible health plan. Um, if you're opening it online, say Fidelity or working with your CFP, they might not need to show that proof, but you'll need to attest to it. Yep. I've got a high deductible health plan. And and your spouse would do that too. Now, way back when, Josh, it feels like when we opened HSAs, this is almost 20 years ago. Yeah, banks didn't know what they were doing. And, uh, and, and so the thought of was I have a family health insurance plan. I'll have a family HSA account. But no, it sort of works just like an IRA. It's one person's the owner of that of that HSA account. Then there's beneficiaries that are attached to it. Yep. So the other spouse would need to open their own HSA. You can use both of them, okay, but they would need to be the primary holder in the HSA. I, I don't know if I ever told you that I had to go to my credit union where I have my HSA and I needed to make a contribution for a prior year. Yep. So it was probably around this time of year in March. You can still be contributing to your HSA. It's not too late yet um, for, for last year. So they had to do it physically on a form and I had to sign the form and it was a Roth IRA form. Oh my. They didn't even have an actual HSA form for this. 
Um, to, to your point, though, it is treated more like an individual account. It's just that the contribution limit is based on is it family or is it individual? So you can still contribute right now. Make sure when you're doing that, you're coding it. If it's supposed to be for last year, you're coding it for last year. Banks and credit unions get this wrong all the stinking time. And if they do, it's an enormous mess. Now, these first two ways of contributing creatively to your HSA, you might say, yeah, I actually, I actually knew that. We've got a complicated, a more unique, creative one. That and more coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Yeah, I don't remember the Roth IRA form, <clears throat> but I do remember going to, I'm assuming it's the same, same credit union, going there and they were like, okay, if you want to contribute this for last year, here's the form to fill out. And I'm like, form? Yeah. <laughs> just put it into your computer. You're right. on it right, right now. Just say. Move it from this, this account to that one. Yeah, just just do it. So weird. It is. And I know we've talked about this on a recent show, but I still, I've just seen banks screw up the contribution year so many times. Yeah. That uh, because that's the reason why I don't mind it going on a form because it says yeah. the year right on there, and then you got proof. Yeah, but but, but as but you're right, as you know, part shareholders, we're unable to contribute out of our paychecks. So I do the contribute. I save up for it all throughout the year, and then make the contribution there at the end of the year. But I don't let that slip over to the next year, even though you're allowed to. You can get up until April April 15. Um, I always do it the last week of the year. I've just got it. I'm in this pattern that I go work with Ryan, one of our CPAs, on my taxes, yeah. get it done, and then go make the contributions. Really? Same same time every year, yeah. and uh, I usually, you know, bring him donuts or something to butter him <laughs> up and hey, get this right, would you please? Uh, yeah. Although probably not this year, he's on uh, quite a health kick, so oh. bring him some carrot sticks or something. There you go, <laughs> carrot cake. <laughs> All right, uh, third segment. We'll. We'll hit this. This is going to be confusing. Then we can wrap it up if we if we need to. Um, and then we'll get into listener questions. Probably, this will probably take the entire segment. So, Are you eligible to, to open a health savings account? How are you, if so, how are you using it? Okay. And what are the creative ways that you can get money into that HSA to get even more benefit. We're helping you with that right now. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Thanks for being here. My name is Mike Bernard. With me in the KFT studios, my business partner, fellow CFP, Josh Gregory. No Kevin Corhorn today. Stay up to date on all Wise Money content. Find us online, wisemoneyshow.com, and then all over social media, wherever you're at, we are there as well. Search the Wise Money Show. We're talking about the HSA today, not how it works, not some creative strategies on investing in it and, and shoeboxing and and, and a spending versus a savings HSA, that sort of thing. No, no, no. We're talking about the unique ways specifically that you can get money into an HSA and get an extra benefit. One is contributing directly out of your paycheck if you can, okay? That, that contribution not only saves you federal and state taxes, also saves you FICA taxes. Next, we hit the catch-up contribution, which is a unique time, happens at age 55, not age 50. And there's a unique way if you're married for your spouse to contribute the catch up as well. So if you missed that, make sure you you check out the uh, earlier parts of the episode on Facebook, uh, excuse me, on YouTube or podcast. Now, this third strategy, this third unique is like really unique, like it's fringe idea. It's not going to apply for everyone. In fact, as we share the circumstances and really how this works, this isn't like, OK, these circumstances line up, go do it. It's no, as always, these circumstances line up. Go check with your CFP. See see if this would make yeah, sense. For sure. So here's the idea. And this was born from our, our health insurance advisors working in a few different scenarios saying, you know what? This makes sense. And then they shared it with me that, wow, it doesn't make sense for a lot of people. But for those where it does make sense, really, really unique way of, uh, of funding an HSA. So here's the thing. If you have a high an HSA eligible, high deductible health plan, and you've got yourself and any other person on that health insurance plan, whether it's your spouse, whether it's your spouse and children, whether it's you and a child because you're single, okay, then you're eligible to contribute the family amount to a health savings account because you and at least one other person are on that health insurance. You can contribute that 7300 as Josh mentioned, okay? So take the scenario 
that you've got lots of resources, okay, either lots of income or lots of income, but also other assets. And your number one priority is how do I shelter as much of this money from taxes as possible? I'm trying to fill up and maximize every contribution that I possibly can. Many people are in that boat. That's fantastic. So if that's you, okay, you've met part of the criteria. The other part is you've got a young adult child that's still on your health insurance because they're legally allowed to be all the way up until they turn age 26. Oh, I thought it was like 76 now. <laughs> You're it, close. <laughs> I think that was in the Build like... Back Better proposal. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. No, so so all the way up until they turn age, age 26. Here's the idea. And then sort of the final criteria is everyone's reasonably healthy. Now that could change tomorrow. But you right now, yeah, everyone's reasonably healthy. Here's the idea. In that scenario... You and your spouse and this adult child are on your HSA eligible high deductible health plan. And that's more that's you and, and at least one other person on the plan. So you can contribute the family amount, 7,300 to the HSA. Consider moving that young adult child onto their own HSA eligible high deductible health plan. Doing so will change the premium. It, it will. So this is why I, we can't blink and say this makes sense for everyone. Hopefully, your insurance premium that you and your spouse are on, that premium goes down a little bit because it's no longer family coverage you need. It's, it's employee plus spouse, mm -hmm. okay, or you plus spouse. Hopefully, that young adult getting their own high deductible health plan doesn't cost them a lot of premium because they either sign up for it through their employer and, and the cost is lower, or they don't make as much money and they're able to get it on the marketplace, healthcare.gov, with some premium tax credits and, and not pay as much. If that's the case, then now the family can still contribute the family amount to your own high deductible health plan, the, uh, or excuse me, your own HSA, 7,300 bucks. But now this adult child also has their own HSA and they can contribute 3,650. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, you can contribute, I mean, 11 grand. And then if you and your spouse are 55 or older, you've got, I mean, you can contribute a lot of money. The family could get a lot of money into tax shelters, into the HSA doing this strategy. Yeah. I mean, the, the basic premise here is how do, how does a family with plenty of financial means available to them, how do you utilize all the tax shelters that you possibly can? That, that's kind of the scenario, yep. right? And you might throw some other tax shelters in under this mix as well. You, you might say, hey, that son or daughter who's on your plan, um, they're still a dependent. They are working maybe, so they've got earned income. Maybe they contribute to a Roth IRA or you contribute for them as yep. well. It, it's a way for the, the family. Th there are enough families out there that say, hey, we have more than enough resources for us to live out life and, and achieve all the goals that we have. There's some portion of this money that's going to go to the next generations when we pass away. Why not get started passing some of this money early? And, and I would say not only that, but there's enough folks out there that say, I really want to help. I see the benefit of starting early in my financial life. Yep. I really want to assist my son or daughter, my child, to start as early as possible. And therefore, yes, they now have an HSA available. I don't know how, they're, how, how they can fund it. The family's got resources. We're going to fund that HSA for them. And uh, or, or just like you said, my you know young adult child is starting to have some earned income. They don't make enough and have enough cash flow to contribute to their own Roth IRA. I'm going to contribute to it for them. I'm going to gift it to them and put the money in the Roth IRA. Same same concept, mm -hmm. same concept. So not universally applicable, but if it is, and there's a handful of you where this strategy absolutely makes sense, work with your CFP. Yeah. My, my goodness. Now, if this is the case for that young adult child, I, that's why one of the criteria is reasonably healthy. Because if they're gonna be, if, if they are on um, medications, or they are, you know, they've got bad joints or whatever, like I do, and hit the deductible every single year. You may not want to do this because now you're splitting that deductible. That's up. right. Yep. Exposing the family to potentially more out of pocket costs. Correct. If you have an unhealthy year or something. So so if you're reasonably healthy or believe you're reasonably healthy, then then consider this. But then the other thing is for that reasonably healthy young adult, you then talk about, well, 
if the if the real idea here was to start early, start saving early, and maximize the use of this of this unique tax shelter, the HSA, then listen, child, as you have out of pocket medical expenses come up, don't touch this thing. You're not touching your HSA. Let's treat this money as long term. Let's invest this money for the future, mm-hmm. and you know we'll try to fund it every single year, the maximum that we can. And as expense medical expenses come up, that time you're on your own. You got to figure out how to budget for that. Yep, I, so. I agree with that completely. Can I tuck in one more bonus? Go ahead. So if there was a fourth, w- one thing that I encountered about a year and a few months ago at the end of 2020, had a client who changed, uh, lost their job, was going to start a business on their own. And so they needed to get their own health insurance in place. And they did an HSA eligible plan right at the end of the year. It was December Ah. of 2020. And normally the rules say that you're allowed to contribute to an HSA on a prorated basis. So if, if your HSA is only open for just that one, one month, you can only do one twelfth of a contribution unless you, um, basically, uh, say that you're going to have this in place for the entire following year, then you can still contribute the maximum amount for that, that whole year. Yep. It was a way to, to totally max out the plan at the last second of the year, got them a great tax write off when they needed it. And, um, I, I don't know, that's something to keep in mind as you're working with your certified financial planner and your health insurance expert. Absolutely. Even more rare, but if it applies, work with your CFP, see if it makes sense. All right, we've got questions from fans of the show. That and more coming up on the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Good one. I've never, the reason I didn't bring it up, I've never done it. I've yeah. never had someone that hasn't had a high deductible health plan and then put it in place for December. Yeah. And it just happened that he had reached, he was leaving an employer after uh, having a, a two year non compete go up and he was ready to kind of fly the nest and yeah. needed to have health insurance. But that one wouldn't have been on my radar. That was, that that only happened because we were collaborating with a health insurance expert who has a financial planning approach or mentality, yeah. right? Yeah. How, how do we do more than just get a good plan in place? So uh, that that is part of the beauty of bringing your whole financial life into one plan that has different professionals with different expertises collaborating together. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So lots of kudos to our, our health insurance team for that one. All right. So let's hit listener questions. We'll start back at the top. Um, or do you want to hit that one I typed in that you said was a question from, I think that's an interesting topic that, yeah, we'll see. We'll hit Steve, see how long it takes and maybe jump down to that one. <clears throat> All right. Where is that one? <laughs> Down at the bottom? Yeah, it's third from the bottom. Okay. All right. Thanks for being here, friends. This is the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. My name is Mike Bernard. With me in the KFC Studios, Joshua Gregory. No Kevin Corhorn today. We're making the most of it, though. Uh, every episode of the Wise Money Show is on the YouTube channel. Go check it out. If you've never been there, search the Wise Money Show on YouTube. Subscribe to it there. Turn on notifications. We drop a lot of content. If there's a financial concept you've thought of, odds are we've talked about it. We've got some content on it on the Wise Money Show on YouTube. So go to, go to YouTube, search the Wise Money Show, subscribe to it, and turn on notifications. We appreciate that. All right, we're into listener questions from fans of the show. Got a few here that we'd love to hit. First one came on the YouTube channel. That's where most question comes from. Uh, from Steve, my wife and I make too much money to contribute to a Roth IRA. I'm trying to figure out if I should convert money from my 403B to my Roth. I'm not well informed on this, but I think I want to avoid RMD from the 403B later in life. I turned 60 this year, plan to retire in 2023. Josh, what are your thoughts? Well, I wow, great question to be asking, and I, I hope that all of our listeners are asking this type of question. Which of these tax shelters should I be utilizing, uh, a traditional retirement plan through work or a Roth retirement plan? And, and the same question applies to IRAs that you do on your own, traditional IRA or Roth IRA. And it really is a fundamental question about when is the best time to pay the taxes on this income that you've earned and you've accumulated in, in accounts and everything. Is now a good time? Because by historical standards, 
tax rates are on the lower end of the spectrum. So if you could redeem some money that you have not paid tax on yet, but you, you want to go ahead and proactively pay tax on it by getting it into a Roth IRA so that someday down the road when you are ready to spend this money, you're pulling it out tax-free at a time that maybe you otherwise would have gotten clobbered with taxes much worse than what we, we have today. Mm-hmm. That's the fundamental or philosophical question. And um, the logistics of it on do you do a conversion inside your retirement plan at work or do you um, use some IRA money and do a conversion inside a Roth IRA? That, that is some of the, um, the mechanics that your certified financial planner can help guide you through. But I, I like that uh, Steve is pointing out to required minimum distributions being down the road. Yeah. This is part of the motivation for a lot of people to get money out of those traditional accounts because there's a day coming at age 72, maybe they'll keep ratcheting that age up, we'll we'll see in future tax laws, but there's a day coming when the government's gonna make you start pulling money out of these accounts, whether you need to spend the money or not, they wanna tax you. And they wanna tax you on some minimal amount of, of that income. Well, boy, you could have so much money accumulated in these retirement accounts that those required minimum distributions out there in the future, it could be a large amount of of extra cash that's landing on your tax return that you're going to pay tax on. And maybe even worse than that, I'll I'll complicate the matters even more. You might have someone in your family that's going to inherit a bunch of money and only have 10 years to pay the tax on all that money. So now all of a sudden, because of some of the recent tax law changes, we're just placing an even bigger emphasis on this idea of converting Roth dollar, or dollars into Roth um, when it makes sense for you. Now, so just like Josh said, kudos for bringing up the concept, being aware, hey, maybe it's something I should consider. What do you guys think? And, and I'm, I'm curious about how can, how can I manage my required minimum distribution out there in the future? I, I agree. I, I love it. Here's my struggle. You're going to retire next year. This That means this could be your last year with earned income, and I don't know what tax bracket you're in. Does it, it doesn't, I, let me say it this way. It doesn't universally make sense that right as you're about to go off of, you know, drop your earned income, mm-hmm. that you should pay a lot of tax. Right by 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 including extra dollars into this tax year to to do a conversion. I'm not saying it never makes sense. I'm saying typically you'd want to consider doing a Roth conversion when you're in a lower tax bracket, and because you're just about on the heels of retiring, there's a chance, I, without knowing all the details, Steve, you're going to be in a lower tax bracket when you retire. Now sure. I, I can't say that for sure. Um, but you've got to keep that in mind. So that's number one. But but that's exactly why you need to ask that question every single year. Because here in 2022, Steve, it might not make sense because of the other income that you'd be piling that Roth conversion on top of. And next year might be the perfect year. Mm -hmm. Maybe the year after after that, even better. We'll we'll see. But the, the point is, don't just make a judgment on Roth versus traditional and let that just stand permanently. You need to revisit that every single year. That's right. And right now, to help you answer this question, you need a multi-year tax projection. Yep. And a 12 or 13-year tax projection is not too long. Uh, I know that sounds terrible, but it's not too long. Why? Because you're 60 and you're planning for a required minimum distribution at 72. So you've got to look at, well, I've got two more years of income. And then will I be drawn Social Security right away? What will my income sources be? Therefore, what will my tax situation potentially be unless they change tax rates? And then what would my IRA or my pre-tax retirement account grow to over that time, net of any distributions? And therefore, what would my required minimum distribution be at age 72? If I lost you there, that's the reason you need a certified financial planner. Those That calculation, that's why Josh and I get up in the, in the, <laughs> get out of bed every day. Our CFPs at KFG salivate over those types of strategies, trying to look and see, well, could this make sense? What would it look like? Blah, blah, blah. Doing that analysis. They love it. If that sounds like you know, the last way you'd want to spend your Saturday, contact a CFP. They would love to help you with that. Last thing that I would say is you talk about you make too much money to contribute to a Roth period. I'm assuming you mean Roth IRA. 
And then you're talking about, should I convert money within my 403B? I want to make sure that you first considered contributing Roth 403B, that you first considered doing that. Uh, what I wouldn't want you to do is contribute pre-tax, but then worry about how can I get money on the Roth side so I'll contribute pre-tax and then do a Roth conversion. That may make sense when your income is uncertain or volatile. I don't know if that's the case in your situation. Again, work with your CFP. A anything you'd add there? No. Nope. I, uh, I gave you a smirk there because you, you said that doing these calculations are what get us out of bed. And that, that is not true. I, it is, <laughs> it is my bladder that gets me out of bed in the morning. Now doing nerdy calculations is what keeps me out of bed. Oh, there you go. But I'm an old man now. So <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Next question here, uh, actually came to Josh in, in person, as opposed to through one of the wise money channels here. But, um, the situation is we've got $100,000 that we've saved up for a down payment on a, uh, payment on a house. We live pretty cheap right now. We're in an apartment in a local city in the Midwest here. With housing prices continuing to go up and going up so quickly, when's the right time to pull the trigger and make the move? I think there's an entire generation of folks that are facing that question, right? Yeah. You know, you, you're just at a stage in life where you're getting yourself established and um, you're ready to do that next adult stage of maybe buying a house or getting a family started or whatever. The thing I love about, about this, they gave us enough details to point out that they've saved up a hundred thousand dollars for a down payment on a house. Fantastic. You don't do that by accident. Yep. Right. Um, and, and they gave me a, enough of a background story that that was hard work, sacrifice, steady contributions that did it. It was them living well within their means, living inexpensively in a, uh, probably a, a very modest apartment, maybe more modest than what their peer group would be. They were just making different choices because you don't just wake up one day and have a hundred thousand dollars for a down payment on a house. Correct. But here's the thing. When you start to get yourself into a financial position where you have options, now the confusion begins, right? Now the struggle begins because when you have options, you have choices and it requires wisdom and it requires an overall plan to know of all these paths that we could be taking, which one makes the most sense for us right now. Mm -hmm. And th that's why the answer has to be in a situation like this to, to begin a relationship with a certified financial planner who's going to help you prioritize your own goals, the, the things that matter to you the most. I think if this was just purely a math problem or just purely trying to make the most economical uh, move possible, the, the thing that's most fiscally responsible, well, you, you'd have to be asking yourself the question, well, is now the right time to purchase a home? What's going to be happening with interest rates on, on the horizon here? We've done shows recently about uh, how the Fed is is posturing as though they're going to be raising rates steadily throughout this year. What does that mean for mortgages? What does that mean for the affordability of a house? Um, so t to me, if you got caught up in all of that that worry or that concern that the world around you is changing and do, is my hand being forced? Is it time to jump into a, a house? You may be letting um, outside factors drive your decisions instead of your overall financial plan. Yeah. I, I would think, I think you're absolutely right, Josh. Comprehensive financial planning and thinking through your own situation. And, and yet, like, I'm thinking also of guiding principles then. Mm -hmm. And those guiding principles would be infused in your financial plan. And, and so, because what will happen with that, with interest rates, what will happen to the housing market, what will, you know, all these things, you don't know. No one knows. Yeah. You can't predict the future. That's right. And you can sort of, well, hey, the, this is happening. So and we are anticipating a couple different outcomes here. It could be a couple different things, but there's no way to know for sure. So you got to lean on sort of guiding principles. And so I think through, okay, what are your overall financial goals? What's your cash flow situation say? How much house, um, what, what cost, what would the cost be for the house that you're looking at? Is that $100,000 a 20% at least down payment? You know, when you do that, uh, how much then mortgage would you have at a certain interest rate? How does this fit in the budget? Those are, and then when you do that, what does that mean to you, the rest of your financial goals? So, I mean, mm -hmm. there's a way to, to take what you, so I'm a math geek and, and, you know, remember story problems? 
Yep. And when you're in elementary school or middle school or whatever, and the trick with story problems would be, you know, typically the head fake. They're they're throwing a couple details out at you that don't really apply, but you've got to figure out the answer with the information they gave you. Mm -hmm. We can't know the future of the housing market. You can't. So how do we come up with an answer based on the information that we do know? Mm -hmm. Okay, we do know you've got 100,000 set aside. We do know how much cash flow you have and what your budget would look like. Therefore, we can take a look and say, well, how much house could this afford? What would this look like? And use those principles. I I agree completely. And I would also ask the question, are there some other goals that are standing between here and purchasing the home? Because maybe one of your goals, maybe you've already checked it off the list, that you have an adequate emergency fund for the life you're living right now. Is your emergency fund sized up to the right level for what your life will be as a homeowner? Because there are just more things that can go wrong when you're a homeowner. If you start a family at some point, there's more things that can go wrong when there's kiddos running around, yeah. right? So m- making sure that you have all the other ducks in a row, not just do I have the cash I want for a down payment and uh, am I ready to start hunting? All right. Great question. Hopefully that's helpful. That's all the time we have for today. On behalf of Josh Gregory, myself, all of us at KFG, have a great weekend. We'll see you next Saturday for the Wise Money Show with Corhorn Financial Group. Securities offered through Silver Oak Securities, member FINRA slash SIPC. Advisory services offered through KFG Wealth Management, LLC. Doing business as Corhorn Financial Group, KFG Wealth Management, LLC, and Silver Oak Securities Incorporated companies are unaffiliated.